I've been a professional photographer for nearly 30 years and a photography educator for more than 12 years now. So I've seen pretty much everything when it comes to common mistakes relating to first time studio lighting users. From shying away from understanding the physics of light to relying on a light meter. Here are nine mistakes you should try to avoid when using studio flash or strobe lighting. So let's get started. Number one, not understanding the physics of light. Photography can be considered both a science and an art. With basic principles of physics governing the practicalities of recording light, directing and modifying it, as well as human biological visual responses and emotion to an image contributing to the outcome and success of that image. If you really want to understand how to use Studio Flash, you do have to make the effort to understand the physics of light. The term physics may sound scary, but it doesn't have to be. You don't have to understand everything, but there are a few key concepts that will serve you well. Useful concepts include the inverse square law, angle of incidence, angle of reflectance, hard light and soft light, direction of light, color theory, diffusion and specularity, reflectance and dispersion. All of these principles I cover in great detail on carltaylereducation.com. Number two, being afraid to experiment. When it comes to using natural light, people seem to have no problem experimenting with side lighting, backlighting, and different times of day. But when it comes to studio light, many photographers want a formula and an instant success instead of experimenting to see what results they can produce. They often want to know that if they use a particular light in a particular position at a particular power setting, that it will work and guarantee success. The truth is, it isn't that simple. I often get photographers asking what power settings I used, or for lighting diagrams of a shoot. But none of this matters unless you're shooting in the exact same scenario with the exact same equipment, shooting distances, modifiers, space, reflectivity, and the same subject. Even the color of the floor would make a difference. These sort of questions demonstrate that people are too afraid to fail, but we need to fail to learn. You shouldn't be afraid to experiment with your lights. It costs us nothing to take as many images as we want. So there's no need to rely on the same go-to lighting setup time and time again. Number three, relying on a light meter. For some reason, even though we're working in the digital age, many photographers still rely heavily on using a light meter to tell them how their images should look. If you want to get creative, you shouldn't be taking directions from someone or something else. Having moved away from film, it costs us nothing to experiment and take multiple images until we're happy with the result. Your eyes should be able to tell you everything you need to know about the exposure of an image and your creative vision should determine what camera settings to use and the amount of light you need. Learn to see the light and you will be amazed how your creative skills and knowledge of lighting develop. To learn how to determine the correct exposure in an image without using a light meter, I recommend watching our Measuring Light and Achieving the Correct Exposure class, where I demonstrate how to do this without a light meter. Although I used to use a light meter when I started my professional career, I haven't used one in about 15 years, since I stopped shooting film. There are two main reasons for this, which are creativity and speed, which I talk about more in a video and I'll provide a link below. Number four, lighting from the front. The first thing so many photographers do when they first start with studio lighting is to stick their light in front of the subject, take the photo and then wonder why everything looks so boring and flat. The direction that light comes from can have a big impact on how an image looks. Typically, side lighting emphasizes texture and form and contrast, while front lighting produces flat two-dimensional looking images. This is one of the first things I show you in my Introduction and Understanding Light class, and it's an important concept to understand. 
I don't tend to use frontal lighting as my key light when shooting. More often, I use side lighting or back lighting as the strongest light in the image, both of which help enhance form and texture. You'll see how food photographer Anna Pushtinakova and I commonly use backlighting in our food photography classes and how I often use side lighting to shape products such as lipsticks or glasses and many other products. Number five, relying on shutter speed. Another question I often get asked is what shutter speed I'm using for a shoot. Once you understand the relationship between shutter speeds, apertures and studio flash, you'll realise that it's not the shutter speed that freezes motion when using studio lighting, but rather the flash burst itself. This is often something that confuses those new to studio photography, but it's a very important concept to understand. When it comes to freezing motion using studio lighting, flash duration is much more important than shutter speed, as studio lighting can attain bursts of light exceeding one ten thousandth of a second, allowing you to freeze the fastest moving subjects. Number six, lighting from too far away. A lot of the time I see new photographers using their lights at some distance from their subject, as if they're too scared to get close. But sometimes if you want the best results, the only option is to get very close. Often when I'm shooting, whether it be product or portrait photography, I'll have the light right up next to my subject, even almost touching. Remember, the distance of the light away from the subject will have a great impact on the final result. In some instances, due to reflective surfaces and softness, you'll need your lights very close. In others, you'll want the light further away to better control the inverse square law. And then the size of the light becomes more important. If your light is too far away, you'll be unnecessarily limiting yourself and making things more difficult than they need to be by creating uncontrollable reflections on gloss surfaces. These very important principles are covered in depth on carltaylereducation.com where I explain the important relationships of distance and size of the light. Number seven not understanding the importance of shadow depth. Shadows are extremely important in photography and visual perception. They are the element that provides contrast and depth as well as mood. There are very specific techniques such as global illumination and controlling shadow fill and colour that have a huge impact on the quality of your images. Most photographers don't fully understand these principles and tend to ignore the quality of shadows. Again, I have extremely detailed and in-depth explanations on how to control shadows for effect and emotion on Carl Taylor Education. These concepts are just too involved to explain clearly in this short video. Number eight, choosing the wrong modifier. It goes without saying that the choice of modifier for a shoot has a big impact on the final result, which is why it's so important that you don't just grab the nearest softbox and assume it will work. Think about what you're shooting, the shape of the subject, the type of light that you need, and the mood you are trying to convey to help you determine which modifier you should be using. For example, if you're shooting a bottle of wine, a small octobox wouldn't be the best choice. In the same way, a parabolic reflector wouldn't be appropriate if you're shooting reflective sunglasses. If you don't have the best modifier for the job, think about how you may be able to modify your light source yourself to make it work. For example, if you have a large octobox but need a strip box, you could try flagging it and making the light smaller to the size that you need. This problem solving approach leads me to my next point. Try to understand why we have different modifiers and their purposes. Knowing the tools goes a long way. Number nine, using lack of equipment as an excuse. This is something I've discussed in depth in previous videos, and I also addressed it in a previous live show, the One Light Challenge product shoot. In that live show, I proved that it was possible to create a high-end product shot of lipsticks using just one light. 
Product photography is a notoriously challenging genre of photography, and people often feel you have to have an endless amount of studio kit to achieve professional results. While I do sometimes use five, six, or seven lights for product shoots, I also sometimes use only one or two. It does depend on the shoot. When you actually understand modifying light, you can even create images that look like studio lighting that didn't even use any studio lighting. Such as this shot, that I created with only natural light, but through knowledge I was able to make it look like studio lighting. Learn to think about how you can apply knowledge to get the most out of your equipment and overcome certain problems. That may require moving your lights to overcome light falloff dictated by the inverse square law, using long exposures to combine multiple lights, or even modifying your modifiers to make them work better for you. Think logically about what you're trying to achieve and try to solve one problem at a time. When you work this way, you'll find things suddenly seem much more manageable. If you've found yourself making any one of these mistakes, that's okay. Learning about studio lighting can take time. Even the best professional photographers will tell you they're still learning. The main thing is to keep practicing and working on your skills. At carltaylereducation.com, we can fast track that learning curve and vastly improve your lighting skills. Thanks for listening. Get my completely free photography course with no sign up required. You can also access our free 90 page ebook. Just click the link or go to carltaylereducation.com.